Neoliberalism was a reaction. It was an effort to disassemble a previous vision of society that once held sway over most of the world. In order to understand neoliberalism, it's important to first understand the world before neoliberalism, the world which neoliberalism considered unacceptable and in need of urgent reconfiguration. That world was the world formed by the post-war consensus, the world of embedded liberalism. Embedded liberalism, as we learned, describes the combination of a liberal democracy paired with a government that is empowered to intervene in a capitalist economy in order to achieve full employment, provide social safety nets or welfare systems for its citizens, sustain economic growth, and enact recovery measures in the event of economic recessions or depressions. In this form of liberalism, market forces are embedded in a social framework that compromises between the class interests of labor and capital in order to enhance human welfare. The bold idea behind this new social paradigm was that the government had a duty to protect its citizens and laborers from economic recessions, which could be caused by unregulated market activity. This was a major contributor to the global crash of markets in 1929, which led to the Great Depression and the impoverishment of millions of people around the world. The Great Depression signaled the end of a long period of economics based on the models of classical liberalism, which was the first economic paradigm to proclaim that markets are self-regulating and that markets should be free from any distortions, such as government intervention, in order to maximize efficiency. The theoretical framework behind this new approach to governance and economics was largely developed by John Maynard Keynes, a British economist who is now considered the father of modern macroeconomics. Keynes was an economic advisor to the American and British governments before and after World War II, who had an enormous impact on economic policy in the latter part of his life and for over three decades after his death. Keynes's written works sparked a revolution in economic thought that provided inspiration for the American and British responses to the Great Depression, such as the New Deal and the National Health Service. At the end of World War II, and in the last years of his life, Keynes represented Britain at the Bretton Woods Conference, where a new global economic system that standardized embedded liberalism was created. Keynes's economic prescriptions, which advocated using government spending to stimulate aggregate demand in order to reduce unemployment, undercut classical economics by showing how government intervention could helpfully mitigate the effects of economic downturns, and that free markets were not necessarily all that was required to achieve full employment and prosperity. Many who were still loyal to classical liberal theory found Keynes's work to be an affront to their traditional understanding of economics, and mistakenly considered Keynes and his followers to be in favor of overbearing and totalitarian governments that sought to constrain economic growth. It is for these reasons that the importance of understanding Keynes's works in service to understanding the eventual reaction to embedded liberalism by neoliberalism cannot be overstated. Truthfully, however, the nature of embedded liberalism is more complicating than this. Just as neoliberalism was born from embedded liberalism, embedded liberalism was spawned from historical trends which have origins all the way back at the turn of the 19th century. In order to better understand neoliberalism, we aren't just going to talk about embedded liberalism, we're also going to talk about the Industrial Revolution, the origins of markets, and the cycle of embedded and disembedded markets throughout history. But first, we're going to follow Keynes's enormous contributions to the development of embedded liberalism, analyze the embedded liberal era itself, and only then place embedded liberalism into a historical context that is far vaster than the era itself. Each of these steps will help us better understand how neoliberalism emerged from embedded liberalism while unlearning important lessons from history in the process. Let's start right before the Great Depression began. The year is 1929, in early September. World War I has been over for a decade. Stock markets are booming, and in America, the Roaring Twenties are still roaring, and some, such as the classical economist Irving Fisher, proclaim that stock prices had reached what looks like a permanently high plateau. That is, except for Roger Babson. Babson, a well-known business theorist of the time, famously predicted in a speech on September 5th that sooner or later a crash is coming, and it may be terrific. The initial market decline which began later that month, was referred to as the Babson Break. In late September, the London Stock Exchange crashed when it was discovered that a wealthy British investor named Clarence Hatchery and his associates had committed fraud and forgery in an attempt to finance a merger. On September 20th, all shares of companies associated with the Hatchery Group, which amounted to about £24 million, which is equivalent to about £2.1 billion of today's dollars, were suspended. This had an immediately noticeable effect on global markets. Over in New York, a persistent feeling of uncertainty amongst stockholders set in after the London crash. For weeks, the volume of sales had been increasing to record-breaking heights due to increasingly frantic periods of selling, 
to the point that the ticker tape which relayed the stock prices to buyers was hours behind the time of sales. Then, at the nadir of the crash, uncertainty gave way to sheer panic. Between October 28th and 29th, which are remembered infamously as Black Monday and Black Tuesday, the stock market completely collapsed, and $30 billion of wealth simply disappeared on those two days alone. The stock market would not return to its pre-crash heights until 1954. The Wall Street crash of 1929 was not the singular cause of the Great Depression, but its arrival certainly unleashed the conditions of poverty, indebtedness, and misery on entire populations around the world. Countries such as the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany, France, Canada, Australia, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Italy, Iceland, Chile, Bolivia, and Peru were all badly affected. Other countries fared better or worse, but few were relatively undisturbed by the Depression, with the exceptions of Spain, China, Russia, and Japan. In the United States, GDP fell about 30%, and the stock market lost almost 90% of its value between 1929 and 1933. The unemployment rate was 3% in 1929, but reached 23.6% in 1932, and peaked in early 1933 at 25%. Prices fell by 20%, causing deflation that made repaying debts much harder. Between 1929 and 1932, the income of the average American family was reduced by 40%, and 9 million savings accounts had been wiped out. By 1932, 273,000 families had been evicted from their homes, and by 1933, 9,490 out of 23,697 banks in the U.S. had failed. The Great Depression is still considered to be the worst economic recession the United States and many other countries around the world have ever endured. It was in this dismal moment that a diverse coalition of citizens, laborers, intellectuals, and politicians around the world began clamoring for solutions to the grave conditions facing huge numbers of people. Prior to 1932, President Herbert Hoover attempted several measures he believed would ameliorate the Depression, but few, if any, made things better. By the end of Hoover's presidency, his public image had deteriorated. Shanty towns and homeless encampments which had sprung up across the country were dubbed Hoovervilles, and the Republican Party as a whole was put on the back foot by a resurgent Democratic Party. In 1932, Hoover's re-election campaign for president was soundly defeated by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who would go on to not only spearhead the New Deal recovery programs, but preside over most of America's involvement in World War II completely realigning American and global politics in the process. It was also during this period that the works of John Maynard Keynes completely shifted the mainstream economic consensus away from classical notions of free market equilibrium and towards the management of aggregate demand by active governments. In 1932, Keynes's reputation as one of the sharpest and most practical economic minds of the time already preceded him. Back in 1915, the British government had called upon Keynes to assist the government during World War I where he developed and applied the system of Allied war loans. In 1919, he represented the British government at the Versailles Peace Conference, where he argued against the massive reparations imposed on the defeated German people by the other powers. After he was ignored, he published a book entitled Economic Consequences of the Peace, in which he correctly predicted that Germany would seek revenge for the economically crippling stipulations of the Versailles Treaty, leading to a war that would be even more deadly than the one recently concluded. In 1933, at the lowest lows of the Great Depression, Keynes published another book, entitled The Means to Prosperity, in which he outlined specific policy proposals for tackling unemployment in a global recession. Though the book was primarily intended for the British government, copies of the book were sent to Roosevelt and other world leaders. Keynes then met Roosevelt face-to-face -face in 1934, while the first New Deal policies were being ratified. While at the time Keynes's ideas only had a marginal influence on U.S. economic policy, his very next work would shake the world of economics to its core and reveal the economic methods that would deliver prosperity for the entire post-war era. Keynes's landmark work, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money, published in 1936, was the strongest theoretical justification for government intervention in the economy the world of economics had ever seen and was a how-to guide for lifting economies out of recessions. Keynes began this work with the radical argument that the classical models of economics, on which he himself had been brought up, were in fact only applicable to a special case of circumstances, while his own models constituted the general case. Keynes argued that aggregate demand was the most important variable determining economic activity, and that insufficient demand could lead to high unemployment, recessions, and depressions. Because people tend to save and hoard money during recessions, Keynes deduced that when savings exceed available investment opportunities, 
profits for business as a whole become impossible, and so layoffs and increased unemployment will result. Crucially, Keynes also challenged the classical idea that unregulated free markets would automatically provide full employment as long as laborers were flexible in their wage demands. He did this by introducing the concept of price stickiness, which was a recognition that in reality, workers often refuse to lower their wages below a certain threshold, even when a classical economist who believes supply always creates its own demand, famously known as Say's Law, might see that as a rational decision. Stimulating aggregate demand, with an acceptance of price stickiness, was a way of getting people to invest rather than save, which would create employment. Because of price stickiness, Keynes argued, the economy required state intervention in order to increase expenditures in either consumption or investment, which are the two components of aggregate demand. By stimulating demand through borrowing, deficit spending, and the creation of public works, the government could provide fiscal stimulus and increase employment, wages, and profitability for employers, lifting the economy out of recession and towards a point where the government could begin effectively repaying the debt it took on to fix the economy in the first place. Only when the economy had escaped the recession would the models of classical economics regain their relevance. Put into plain language, Keynes was simply saying that governments could escape recessions by creating a supply of work and wages for their citizens, increasing their ability to spend. If citizens could still work and earn wages despite the conditions of the recession, they would have money to consume goods and services or invest, which would help companies expand, keep hiring workers, and find new markets elsewhere. In this way, the government could prop up aggregate demand until the citizens' consumption and investment had returned to healthy levels. And one of Keynes's most notable accomplishments was his demonstration that in the absence of government expenditure, a country's economy could be trapped in a high unemployment equilibrium for an extended period of time. This was all a radical departure from the prior economic consensus, which held that government action was incapable of changing the level of employment. The general theory immediately ignited discussion and controversy in the realms of both academia and policy. It was extensively reviewed in journals and newspapers all around the world, and even its harshest critics had to acknowledge that it contained some novel insights. By 1939, only three years later, it was considered a revolutionary work that approached the impact of classical legends like Adam Smith and David Ricardo. Governments around the world also took notice of Keynes's general theory. The very first government to adopt Keynesian demand management policies was Sweden in the 1930s. Of course, the most salient examples of Keynesian-inspired policies are the New Deal programs in the US, the British welfare systems developed under the Attlee government after 1945, and the international economic system developed at Bretton Woods that lasted all the way until the late 1970s and the arrival of neoliberalism. It is no exaggeration to say that without Keynes's general theory, there would have been no post-war consensus, and no period of embedded liberalism as we understand it today. While the very first of the New Deal plans were passed before the true advent of the Keynesian Revolution, many world leaders such as Roosevelt were already acquainted with Keynes's positions, as he had been arguing for public works as a means by which the government could stimulate the economy and tackle unemployment as early as 1924. Nevertheless, the intellectual case supporting the New Deal policies, and interventionist policies in general, was only strengthened over time by Keynes's general theory. The New Deal legislation, which was passed in two major phases throughout the 1930s, created dozens of new programs and administrative bodies in order to provide relief and recovery to struggling people and to reduce instability in the economy. This revolutionary period of activist governance, empowered to intervene in the economy, paved the way for the embedded liberal era that lifted the United States out of the Great Depression, into the rapid mobilization for World War II, and the unprecedented prosperity of the 50s and 60s. The initial array of new social programs, commonly referred to as the First New Deal, was passed between 1933 and 1934. President Roosevelt first attacked the weaknesses of the American banking and financial systems. These systems had contributed greatly to the severity of the crash and the resulting depression in several ways. It is commonly thought that the extraordinary heights of the stock market prior to the crash were inflated by millions of amateur stockholders engaging in speculation on prices. For this, the New Deal established the Securities and Exchange Commission to monitor financial activity and cut down on speculation. It also increased transparency on Wall Street by passing the Securities Act of 1933, which required the disclosures of balance sheets and other information about firms whose securities were traded. The first New Deal included the Banking Act of 1933, better known as Glass-Steagall, which separated commercial banks and securities firms, further discouraging banks from speculating and making risky investments themselves. Lastly, another large contributor to the severity of the Great Depression was the rate of bank failures caused by bank runs, or when large numbers of people withdraw their entire deposits. 
The first New Deal restructured and restricted the banking system by reopening and sometimes merging sound banks under the Treasury's supervision and ended the risk of bank runs by establishing the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. The first New Deal also put a large emphasis on relief for the poor and unemployed with a collection of new social programs. The Emergency Relief Administration provided money for relief operations in states and cities across the country. The Public Works Administration increased employment through the creation of public buildings, roads, bridges, schools, and airports, among other things. The National Recovery Administration created programs centered on establishing minimum wages and maximum work weeks for specific industries. And President Roosevelt personally considered the health of the agricultural industry to be paramount to recovery, and created many organizations for the sole purpose of reinvigorating the profitability of farm production. The Second New Deal, which ran from 1935 to 1938, contained even more dramatic and controversial programs. It included the Social Security Act, which created the framework for the entire U.S. welfare system that we still use today. Before Social Security, only one state in the entire United States, Wisconsin, had an old age insurance program. Once the Social Security Act was passed, it established a permanent system of universal retirement pensions, unemployment insurance, and welfare benefits that had never existed in the U.S. before. Though the Social Security Act was rather conservative by European standards, it was a transformative institution for American society that remains integral to the health of many Americans today. The Second New Deal also took the health and security of laborers very seriously. It included the National Labor Relations Act of 1935, also known as the Wagner Act, which protected labor organizing by allowing workers to collectively bargain through unionization. The immediate result was a tremendous growth in membership of newly empowered labor unions who could effectively bargain for improved work conditions. The Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938 set a maximum of 44 work hours per week, established a minimum wage, and forbid child labor of children under the age of 16, while children under 18 years old were barred from working in hazardous environments. The New Deal was sprawling and ambitious in scale, but arguably didn't fully embody Keynesian thinking. Roosevelt and the other New Dealers didn't believe in deficit spending, and preferred balanced budgets instead. But this changed with the onset of World War II. The start of the war coincided with the ascendancy of Keynesian economics in mainstream thought, and so at last Roosevelt and the New Dealers turned to Keynesian deficit spending as they prepared to enter the war. Massive borrowing by the government to spend on the war effort was the last nail in the Great Depression's coffin. By paying factories and companies up front to aggressively recruit anyone they could find to manufacture weapons and tools for the war, the U.S. finally reached full employment for the first time since the beginning of the Great Depression. The federal military budget soared, completely eclipsing the New Deal programs by 1941. Keynesianism had worked, but it was war that twisted the government's arm to finally embrace Keynesian deficit spending, not its social programs. In the midst of the war, in 1942, another British economist named William Beveridge formulated a plan for a more comprehensive welfare state in Britain with Keynesian and New Deal overtones. His influential report, Social Insurance and Allied Services, called for a national health service, a national insurance contribution, and a 3% unemployment target. Beveridge argued to his skeptics that welfare institutions would increase the competitiveness of British industry by shifting labor costs such as health care and pensions out of the private sector and into the public sector. He also observed that a healthier and wealthier population would naturally be more motivated and productive and capable of stimulating demand. Only three years later, Clement Attlee defeated Winston Churchill for prime minister in 1945 on a platform of reform policies inspired by Keynes and Beveridge leading to the Labor Party's biggest victory in their history and the creation of the National Health Service, among many other popular welfare and housing programs. Though Roosevelt had already died by the time Attlee took power, Keynesian economic policy had taken root in the Western world and planted the seeds of the international post-war consensus. Before the eventual defeat of the Axis powers in 1945, the Allied forces were already discussing amongst themselves how to rebuild and restructure the world along their lines. In 1944, Keynes represented the United Kingdom in the international negotiations at the Bretton Woods Conference, a large-scale negotiation that would have an immeasurable impact on the political and economic stability of the post-war world. It was at this crucial gathering that the components of global embedded liberal policy were formally established. At its core, embedded liberalism was an era born from enormous tragedies, one being the Great Depression and the other being two world wars. The architects of embedded liberalism, such as Keynes, sought to construct a world that was much more economically and politically stable than the tumultuous decades that had preceded it. 
the means of achieving this stability was to balance two somewhat conflicting objectives. The first was to allow national governments to provide generous welfare programs for their citizens and to intervene in their economies to maintain full employment. This was the style of economics that Keynes had introduced in response to the Great Depression. Developed countries around the world now agreed that any successful international economic system would have to assure that governments could still pursue domestic stability, employment, and growth without allowing domestic goals to be dislocated by global shocks. The second objective was the resuscitation of an international trading system that would boost global GDP. Before World War I, accommodating and participating in an international trading system managed by the gold standard system was the foremost objective of most national governments. Unfortunately, the First World War, the Depression, and the Second World War each badly damaged that global trading system. During the Depression, countries raised barriers to trade in attempts to keep their failing economies afloat, leading to the devaluation of national currencies, the inflammation of political tensions, and the deterioration of world trade. However, had the world simply returned to the pre-World War I system of global trade, the accomplishment of the first objective would likely become impossible, because in an unrestricted free market for international capital, such as was the case prior to World War I, investors could easily withdraw money from the nations that attempted to implement interventionist or redistributive policies and reinvest it in countries that lacked such policies. Also, the Bretton Woods representatives were keen to avoid another Treaty of Versailles situation, where unrealistic and unsustainable economic expectations were imposed on countries that could not satisfy those requirements engendering balance of payment crises and the spread of reactionary movements. This was a possibility Keynes was all too aware of. In July 1944, 730 delegates from the 44 Allied nations met at the Mount Washington Hotel in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. It was there that they deliberated for close to a month about how to balance the needs of the post-war world. The two major influencers present at the conference were Keynes, the British delegate, and Harry Dexter White, representing the U.S. The conference was mainly devoted to settling the details of two major projects. The first was the creation of the International Monetary Fund, which would maintain an adjustable foreign exchange market rate system that was pegged to gold. The second was the creation of the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, better known today as the World Bank, whose purpose was to speed global reconstruction after World War II, mostly by lending for large infrastructure projects. It was with these two international bodies, working in tandem with national governments, that the Bretton Woods representatives aimed to arrive at the compromise necessary for the post-war world. The IMF's system of fixed exchange rates would tightly control the values of currencies, ensure sound balances of payment between trading nations, and blunt the negative effects of speculative financial capital flows into the realm of domestic policy. On the other hand, the IBRD would help rebuild society by lending out funds paid into the bank through subscriptions paid by member states in gold and national currencies. The functions of these two organizations were combined with national governments that were permitted to maintain capital controls on the flow of capital into their capital accounts, preventing damaging flights or influxes of capital. These were the basic criteria on which all of the Bretton Woods representatives agreed. In the course of the conference, however, Keynes proposed another ambitious institution for the new economic order, which he called the International Clearing Union. Keynes argued that the ICU would be a bank that could print its own currency, called the Bancor which would be exchangeable for national currencies at a fixed rate. This would provide nations a unit for measuring their trade deficits or surpluses with each other. Keynes thought that this would be a solution for countries with trade deficits that were unable to overcome their debts, therefore stifling economic growth on a global scale. In a sense, Keynes was advocating for an international economic government that could act as a mediator between countries with asymmetrical trading situations, allowing debtor countries and creditor countries to quickly balance each other out without any global economic slowdown or simmering political tensions. However, the American delegate, White, adamantly refused Keynes's proposal. Instead, White insisted that the Bretton Woods system use the US dollar as its reserve currency with optional convertibility into gold. White viewed the IMF's role as closer to a conventional bank, which made sure that borrowing states would repay their debts on time. As the representative of the world's largest creditor and the holder of two thirds of the world's gold supply, White was securing very favorable conditions for the U.S. with his plan. And because it would inevitably be the U.S. that would be supplying most of the credit to this new international system, White's influence on this matter prevailed over Keynes's experimental cooperative system. Despite the fact that Keynes's proposal was refused, he was still satisfied with the results of Bretton Woods, saying that if the institutions stayed true to their founding principles, the brotherhood of man will have become more than a phrase.
Keynes, whose health had been seriously compromised by a series of heart attacks in the last years of his life, died in 1946 at the age of 62. It was only upon his death that the era of embedded liberalism, the era that would reap the benefits of his economic ideas, was truly born. After Bretton Woods, the United States, the United Kingdom, and most of the rest of the world formally turned to embedded liberalism in order to finance the reconstruction of their societies and guarantee the well-being of future generations. And for a time, this succeeded. The era of embedded liberalism lasted from roughly 1945 to 1979, only 34 years, but was one of the most uniquely prosperous and stable periods in human history. It is frequently referred to by historians as the golden age of capitalism. But what was it that made embedded liberalism so good? On the macroeconomic scale, the economic growth and health experienced during this period was unprecedented. World real GDP growth averaged 4.8% for the entire period, and never once dipped lower than 3% between 1951 and 1973, which essentially means that there was not a single recession during that entire time. Unemployment levels were consistently kept at historically low rates, fulfilling the major promise of the embedded liberal compromise. Economic volatility, which can have a negative effect on GDP growth, was also consistently kept low, reducing uncertainty about future trends. Inflation was kept low, at an average of 3.9%, until the stagflation of the 1970s appeared. Income inequality was also much lower than it is today, both globally and within individual countries, offering a world with less political corruption and social stratification. Politically speaking, this was the era of the post-war consensus. Developed countries all over the world shifted their focus to full employment, strong trade unions, nationalization of weak industries, educational reform, heavy regulations, high taxes, and generous welfare states. And with the international Bretton Woods Agreement in place, the system of fixed exchange rates would guard against the deflation, currency speculation, and economic barriers that caused the economic turmoil and inflamed political tensions of the 1920s and 30s. Tariffs were lowered, and economic cooperation was pursued to the utmost degree unless it impacted domestic legislation. Of course, the United States was the prime mover behind the world economy thanks to White's maneuvering, but the U.S. played this role ably, injecting huge amounts of recovery funds into worldwide reconstruction through the Bretton Woods institutions and the Marshall Plan. This new economic and political reality did improve the lives of everyday people. The embedded liberal era was a great time to be alive in almost any developed country. Housing and education were cheap, especially for returning American soldiers entitled to GI Bill benefits. Stable, long-term employment was plentiful. Labor unions were strong, and the rights of laborers were vigorously defended. Social mobility was real and attainable for middle-class families and immigrants from poor nations across the world. The stock market recovered to levels not seen since 1929. Tax rates were much higher for the richest members of society, reducing inequality, and providing the government with funds to spend on public works or welfare programs in Keynesian fashion. And thanks to the fact that the average citizen was better protected from poverty under embedded liberalism, sustained participation in important social movements became more possible than ever. This isn't to say that the period was completely perfect. War and terrorism still existed. Political corruption and anti-intellectualism still occurred. Certain members of society were still excluded from political enfranchisement and material prosperity based on their race, gender, or sexual orientation. And an entire generation was born into this post-war era who would take the hard-fought and highly anomalous prosperity of this era for granted, while doing almost nothing to protect it against forces that were patiently waiting for its demise. Embedded liberalism, as a whole, was an extraordinary period in history, and one that only becomes more relevant when attempting to dissect neoliberalism. As we'll see in future episodes, the path to neoliberalism was paved by the systematic dismantling of the accomplishments of the embedded liberal era. Keynesianism's reputation as a dependable economic approach was diminished. Society's trust in government to enhance freedom through intervention was replaced by intense suspicion of big government meddling. And the mechanics of the Bretton Woods post-war consensus including the fixed exchange rate system and national capital controls, were discarded in favor of floating exchange rates and rapid financial globalization. But in order to prepare ourselves for future episodes devoted solely to aspects of neoliberalism, we must first go one step further in our understanding of embedded liberalism conceptually, and the true nature of embedded liberalism, and of the concept of embeddedness in general, is still more complicating than this summary. So far, we've only talked about embedded liberalism in the context of the Keynesian reforms of the 20th century. But the actual origin of the term embedded liberalism is a patchwork of different authors and influences that coalesces into a powerful descriptor of certain historical trends. 
Ironically, the phrase embedded liberalism itself wasn't coined until 1982, which is shortly after the neoliberal revolution. It was first used by a scholar named John Gerard Ruge in an analysis of the post-war economic order. However, Ruge states that he himself borrowed the concept of embeddedness from Karl Polanyi, a Hungarian-American socialist philosopher. It is from Polanyi's major work, The Great Transformation, from 1944, that the term embeddedness was taken to describe embedded liberalism. Polanyi's concept of embeddedness is much more nuanced than what we've discussed thus far. An understanding of Polanyi's writing informs us that, in fact, the transition from classical free market liberalism to embedded liberalism is just one phase of a cycle that has roots all the way back at the dawn of industrialization in England. Polanyi argues that until the turn of the 19th century, markets, wherever they existed, had always been embedded in society. They were subordinated by social relations, by religious institutions, by traditions of reciprocity, gift-giving, and redistribution of resources. Markets were means through which existing social relationships and norms were expressed, and were not ends in and of themselves. When industrialization rapidly emerged in England, classical English thinkers responded to its disruptions by crafting the very first theory of market liberalism, with the core belief that human society should be subordinated to self-regulating markets. These beliefs, that markets are self-regulating and exist outside of society, quickly spread across the world along with industrial capitalism itself. This was the moment in which the market ceased being embedded in society and for the first time in human history became an entity separate from society, to which society was meant to be subordinated. Polanyi identifies this moment as 1834, with the passage of legislation in England that created the very first markets for labor. From this point on, labor, land, and money were converted into commodities to be bought and sold at market prices. Polanyi calls these commodities fictitious, because he believed it was evident that these things, man, nature, and mediums of exchange, were obviously not created to be bought and sold on a market, and that commodifying these things would push both man and nature to the precipice of annihilation. An important part of Polanyi's stance is that attempting to completely disembed markets from society was harmful, but also impossible, a utopian project. Harmful because he believed human beings should never be commodified and subjected to the impersonal logic of a market, and impossible because society would inevitably protect itself, either consciously or unconsciously, from the dangers posed by self-regulating market societies. This urge of society to protect itself from the advancing march of the self-regulating market is what Polanyi called the double movement. In the Polanyian account, the catastrophes of the early 20th century that embedded liberalism was emerging from, the Great Depression and the World Wars, were violent expressions of the unconscious double movement reacting to the attempt to organize the global economy on the basis of disembedded markets anchored to the gold standard system. Polanyi saw World War I as the result of tensions between imperial powers rushing to colonize the world in competition for valuable natural resources that would make their home countries financially solvent under the rigid gold standard system. World War II was the moment that self-regulating markets and democracy both failed to protect society, allowing fascism to fill the void. In both cases, society underwent massive convulsions in the form of global conflicts and depressions as reactions to the disembedding of markets that had occurred a hundred years earlier. The double movement is a powerful explanation for the rise of embedded liberalism. Once World War II had concluded, Markets were, for the first time since 1834, after 111 years, re-embedded in society with the help of Keynesian economic policies. Keynesianism, in a way, was a recognition that there is no way the government can possibly abstain from the management of the fictitious commodities without incurring financial chaos and widespread human suffering. The double movement had successfully reverted markets to an embedded liberal position by legitimizing government intervention in the self-regulating market. The needs of humanity had finally begun to reassert themselves over the needs of the market. But this was a short-lived victory for defenders of society. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, markets were once again disembedded under the administrations of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, who represented the market forces at the opposite pole of the double movement. This is the period of neoliberalism, which is in fact the second period of market disembeddedness in human history, the period we are still living in today. Neoliberalism might have been a reaction against embedded liberalism, but the truth is that the feud that defines our times is not simply between the neoliberal version of capitalism and the embedded version of it. 
The truth is that the fundamental conflict at the heart of the neoliberal crisis is between the idea of a disembedded market, which is now protected by market-captured governments under neoliberalism, and the rest of human society. With Polanyi's concept of embeddedness in hand, the importance of Keynes is revealed to be not simply that he helped create embedded liberalism, but that he helped re-embed markets back into the fabric of human society, and remove the self-regulating market from a position of supremacy over humankind, if only temporarily. But there was another man who wanted to dominate economic thought like Keynes did, who stood in Keynes's shadow throughout the 40s, 50s, and 60s, slowly building the arsenal for his counter-revolution all the while. The origin of neoliberalism, of the reaction to Keynesian state intervention, and the real beginning of our story is found in the work of one man, Friedrich August von Hayek. <laughs>